Introducing the De Havilland Comet. Are you tired of small cramped seats, noisy propeller engines and bumpy turbulent flights? The De Havilland Aircraft Company proudly presents the world's first jet-powered airliner, the DH-106 Comet. Yep, I really like it. But that's not all. Our new jetliner provides a state-of-the-art luxury interior for you to stretch your legs. Hungry? How does a five-course meal sound? Tired? Go on, take a nap. We'll get you to Cairo, London, or Tokyo before you know it. That is assuming we don't catastrophically depressurize midair and go down in a ball of flames. Oh no! Haha! <laughs> the Second World War was coming to a close, nations prepared to draw back the curtains of the last seven years of pain and hardship, and look forward to a new era of growth and prosperity. Amongst the countries who had suffered heavily at the hands of the Axis powers, Britain needed to make a fast recovery to ensure its place as a formidable world power. One area particularly suited to the British Empire was commercial aviation. With the vast size and spread of the Commonwealth, the potential for air travel and advancing airplane design was seen as the obvious future for the, until now, military-focused British aircraft industry. With the government's forming of the Brabazon Committee, studies and plans were proposed to establish Britain as the world's foremost civilian airplane supplier. Many plans and designs were submitted, but one stood out from the rest. Not for being the best or most economical, but the most revolutionary and with the least likelihood of success. Geoffrey de Havilland flew in the face of current aviation trend when he suggested the future wasn't the propeller-powered airplane. Instead, he wanted to take the cutting edge of military aviation and shove it into a commercial plane. The jet engine, and in so doing, inducting the world into the era of the jetliner. The problems and obstacles to overcome would be daunting. He would be taking the industry into unexplored fields of engineering and with very high risks. The main problem with using jet engines on commercial airliners was the inefficiency. These powerful engines were built for speed, not economics and efficiency. There was a potential way around this, however, but it was risky. Airplanes at the time were propeller-driven and typically flew at altitudes of 10 to 20,000 feet. De Havilland proposed flying at 40,000 feet. This would allow his jetliner to clear most weather conditions and for the jet engines to operate efficiently. So, if the solution was a radiant hand, where was the problem? Flying at such dizzying heights would require the cabin to be pressurized. Though the concept wasn't new, it was cutting-edge technology. Understanding of metal fatigue, pressurization and advanced alloys was in its infancy. That wouldn't stop de Havilland, however. He dreamt of an era of luxury flight travel where planes didn't shake and rattle. His jetliner would be quiet, smooth, and fast. Very fast. In fact, 50% faster than the competition. Unfortunately, he was indeed to pave the way for such travel, but for his competitors, as the de Havilland Comet was about to become the stuff of nightmares. The first completed Comet 1 was to take flight on the 9th of January, 1951. By all measurements, the de Havilland Comet had a bright future and looked to be a commercial success. And the aircraft worked very well. The airplane was living up to expectations, even going so far as to host Prince Philip on his return from the Olympic Games in Helsinki. The royal family became no stranger to de Havilland's Comet when Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret joined Geoffrey and Lady de Havilland on a special flight. But the first signs of trouble were already brewing. On October 26, 1952, a BOAC flight departing from Rhone failed to become airborne. It skidded off the end of the runway, but luckily there were only minor injuries. A mere four months later, the same type of incident would repeat itself in Karachi with the Canadian Airlines Comet. They weren't to be as fortunate, however. As it failed to take off and skidded off the end of the runway, it ran into a hard embankment, killing all five aircrew and six passengers. The world now had its first fatal jetliner crash. Investigations would lead to the conclusion that the wings had lost lift on takeoff, likely due to pilot error. They believed the pilots had over-rotated, leading to the plane losing lift. In response, de Havilland had the wings reprofiled and wing fences added. This over-rotation was the result of a brand new feature the Comet boasted that was to become a mainstay on future aircraft, even today. Powered flight controls. 
This was essentially a form of fly-by-wire. No longer were the control surfaces directly connected to the flight controls, but instead routed through hydraulic systems. This allowed the pilot greater ease of control and comfort, and at the same time stopped control surfaces from reacting to environmental forces. The drawback was there was very little sensitivity, so the pilot couldn't feel the plane approaching its limits. The design feature that really set the Comet above other planes of its time was the integrated jet engine and wing. Rather than supporting the engines underneath the wing and pods, the lead designer, Ronald Bishop, chose to build them into the wings. This aided with the aerodynamics of the plane, but also added weight as the engines needed to be shielded from each other in the event of a catastrophic failure. Initially powered by four de Havilland Ghost Mark I turbojet engines with a combined thrust of 20,200 pounds, it would eventually grow to 40,000 pounds while utilizing the Rolls-Royce Avon M502 engines. But the Comet was about to become infamous for all the wrong reasons. May 2nd, 1953. BOAC Flight 783 had just departed from Calcutta, India into treacherous conditions. A thunder squall. Unlike a wind gust which lasts mere seconds, this is high wind speed for minutes. Six minutes into its flight, the plane is witnessed by observers falling from the sky on fire with no wings, no survivors. An inquiry blames the crash on weather conditions and pilot error. The wings experience extremely high negative g-forces in the thunder squall, and in an attempt to pull up from a dive, the pilot might have overstressed the fuselage without realizing due to the new powered flight controls. Metal fatigue and structural stress weren't considered, and the Comet was cleared to continue with two modifications. All Comets were to be equipped with weather radar, and the Q-Fuel system was introduced. With the powered flight controls, this was also a world's first. This artificial feel, or force feedback, was to simulate actual outside forces on the control surfaces to restore sensitivity to the instruments the pilots were manipulating. That the investigators didn't consider metal fatigue of the fuselage as a contributing cause would come back to haunt them. During the development of the Comet, fuselage and cabin pressurization were something new. This was a critical point of the project, and much time, money, and effort were put towards understanding this new science. Initially, parts of the fuselage were tested in a decompression chamber to failure, but finding the origins of the cracks and failures proved difficult. Bishop returned to the tried and tested water tank. This allowed them to slowly increase pressure and see where the failure started. They tested sections of the fuselage to 16,000 cycles, the equivalent of 40,000 hours of flying. Though they had conducted in-depth testing, there were many factors at play. Bolt holes, rivets, new structural glue compounds, and even never-before-used alloys and plastics were needed to ensure the plane was compliant. Along with this, the first generation of Comets had rather weak engines, so weight was reduced wherever they felt possible to compensate. All these factors would contribute to the Comets' inglorious end. January 10, 1954. 20 minutes after taking off from Rome, a comet breaks up mid-air. It plummets into the sea near Elba. All 35 people on board, dead. In order to find out what went wrong, the ABLE committee was established to investigate. At the same time, the Royal Navy was tasked to recover as much of the wreckage as possible. As the Navy went about its work, the committee looked into flight control failure, metal fatigue, window panels, and other components. Just as the Navy had recovered parts of the wreckage, the ABLE committee closed the investigation, stating that the likely cause was fire and the plane was safe to fly. It was a cover-up of sorts. There was far too much invested in the Comet to find any failure with the airplane and to postpone its return to the air. They returned to the skies, but only briefly. A mere three months later, another Comet was to meet a fiery end after departing from Rome. All 21 souls aboard were lost. This time, the Comet was grounded. The Cohen Committee was established with the instructions of Winston Churchill that the root cause of these crashes must be found at any cost. Metal fatigue and fuselage failure were immediately considered. The remnants of the fuselage from Elba and a donated fuselage from BOAC were to be extensively tested in a custom-constructed water tank able to hold an entire fuselage. The results were immediate and conclusive. After just over 3,000 flight cycles, the hull burst open. A tear was found to have started from a bolt hole and spread. It could have been stopped, but the weight savings meant that the skin was much too thin to prevent the gap from widening. They tested another hull, and the same thing happened, but this time from a rivet hole near the automatic direction finder window in the cockpit. 
The fate of the comet was written on the wall. Though the comet was re-engineered and returned to service by 1958, its reputation was permanently tarnished. The true cause of the failure of the fuselage was thought by the public to be the large, square passenger windows. In fact, this was a misconception likely heralded by the failure in the direction finder window. It didn't matter though. The Americans had caught up, and Boeing had introduced its 707 and Douglas the DC-8. The American competition was bigger, faster, and could cover greater distances. The Comet continued to fly for another 40 years, but never became the success it could have been. In all, the Comet would go on to experience 25 hull losses, 13 fatal crashes, and 492 fatalities. Though it advanced commercial flights by leaps and bounds, it never recovered. Boeing and Douglas even privately disclosed if de Havilland hadn't experienced depressurization problems first, they would have. De Havilland was a trailblazer, and the issues the comet experienced were sadly, likely unavoidable. Nonetheless, he brought the world forward into the age of the jetliner. For that, at least, he has our thanks. If this video gets out in time, wishing you a happy holidays. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe, like, and share. Next time, 